Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, a lecture that I call Metadata Palooza, uh, otherwise known as uh, ETL Architecture in Depth. We do have um, a collection of both ME Bank and, uh, and DWS uh, visitors here. Um, so this lecture offered jointly to both. I'm sure you saw that when you, uh, when you signed up. Um, so uh, on behalf of DWS, uh, once again, thanks ME Bank for letting us use the, uh, the space. Um, a few years ago, uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to go to Ralph Kimball's uh, or Kimball University um, ETL Architecture in Depth uh, four day workshop or seminar uh, and got to meet the great man himself, Ralph Kimball. Um, I uh, walked away with that with a great deal of knowledge and a free book, uh, the Data Warehouse uh, ETL Toolkit. Uh, I've also purchased uh, my own copy of uh, the other data warehouse toolkit, not the ETL one, the dimensional modeling one. Uh, you might know these books very well if you've uh, been in the dimensional modeling space. Um, if not, uh, I'll hand them around and, uh, and have a look at them as we go. Um, please don't uh, draw any notes in the margins there. All right, so we're here to talk about metadata. Uh, it's a pretty dry subject, of course. Let's see if I can get this. Working. Are you scrolling. Hang on. I'll have to use this. Yeah. There we go. So, um, so let's start with a question. Oh, all right. I'll read it out. <laughs> what is? What is metadata? Excuse me, Geva? <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I am having trouble hearing. <laughs> it's information about who did what event. Right. Information? Information about data? Anyone else? Yes. Has it a guess? That sounds about right? Okay. I'm going to try again. There we go. Who said data about data? Yeah? Okay. Does that, does that help us? <laughs> so do, does that answer the question though? That what's metadata? It's data about data. Um, so another way of saying it, uh, or the way I prefer to say it, is that if you take your data and you add your metadata, you get information. But does that really help us? All right. Here's an example. Sorry, I just want to make sure I'm not skipping over slides. No, I'm good. Here's an example. All right, that's data. Who recognises this screen? Who uses SQL Server here? Come on, we all do. Yeah. So this is a uh, this is a screen in SQL. This is a, uh, a, a SQL session in SQL Server. And uh, if you have a look up the top there, we've got a um, uh, we've got a SQL statement, and we've got some results down there. That's data. We recognise data, don't we? Because that's what we work with. All right. That's metadata. So the column names. Does that make sense? All right. So, look, thanks very much for coming in. This was uh, Metadata Palooza. <laughs> and, uh, and we're about done. Um, oh, sorry. There's, there's actually more metadata there. The, uh, down the bottom, we've got the, um, uh, the environment details. Uh, we've got uh, the database name, the runtime, number of rows returned. That's all metadata as well, of course. All right. These slide transitions going beautifully for me. All right, and that's metadata. So our schema definition there, the column names, the uh, the data types, and the the not null constraints. That's all metadata. That describes the database where we got our data from. That adds information to to the data that we retrieved. It tells us that the uh, that the SKU is a uh, varchar fifty, and that's not null. It tells us something. It tells us. Uh, tells us more about that SKU and it turns it into information. And interestingly, that's metadata too, the SQL statement. Right? So when we're talking about metadata, we're actually talking about a whole lot of stuff. And we usually think of metadata as just being like, um, I, I sort of think of it as, uh, as being the schema definitions or the data models. But metadata is a lot more than that. So Ralph tells us, 
But metadata is a lot of things. There's, uh, there's source system metadata, there's source spe specifications, repositories, source schemas, copy books, proprietary or third party source schemes. Oh, there's source descriptive information like ownership of business descriptions of each source. Oh God, data staging metadata, data acquisition information from data transmission scheduling and it's going too fast and data cleansing specifications and aggregate modification logs and audit job logs and documentation and business descriptions of extract processing and DBS system table contents, view definitions, oh man. Pre canned query and report definitions, network security usage statistics are not going to get to the end of that line. Favorite websites as a paradigm for all data warehouse access. There's over 50 different definitions of metadata in that book that I've just handed around, the, uh, the ETL uh, Data Warehouse Toolkit. Um, if you think that there is one tool that allows you to capture all metadata in a data warehouse, then you're kidding yourself. It doesn't exist. So we've got, according to Ralph, uh, 56 different types of, of metadata. Uh, we can't capture them all. We know that there is no universal metadata capture tool. It's, it, it is a, it's a happy myth. There are, uh, there are providers that would like to tell us that, uh, that, that it's real, but it's not. Uh, so what do we do? Do we give up? Or do we take those 56 different types of metadata and focus on the things that actually make a difference or that where we in the, uh, in the data warehouse or the ETL space, where we can actually make a difference and, uh, and deliver value on metadata. And that's what we're here to talk about. So uh, Kimball Group defines metadata in three different ways or it breaks it up into, uh, into three different definitions. Um, and at this point, I'm just going to read off that slide. <laughs> We've got business data, uh, business metadata, which is the meaning of data in business terms. Anyone got a good example of business metadata? Definition of party. Definition of party. Okay. So that, uh, that, that's a specific example of, uh, of metadata. Um, as a, a, an example of uh, what class of, of metadata, so before we go up to business <laughs> metadata, definition of party is an example of a... Oh, okay, I was actually going for, for business glossary there, but okay. <laughs> Again, a little bit too specific for me. We've got technical metadata. So um, if business data is the stuff that the business is interested in, technical metadata, but we're all, we're all uh, sort of ETL people, we're IT folk, aren't we? That's the stuff that we're interested in internally. So technical aspects of, uh, of the data. So I'll just turn this mouse off so it doesn't jump all over the place. Uh, and we've got process data. Process data seems to be the, um, the forgotten metadata. So in our ETL system, we've got all this data flowing through from source systems into our, uh, into our business intelligence solution. And, uh, and that, the, the process of, of loading all that data produces results. And those results are just not data. Uh, so all of, all of that processing, uh, the information from that processing can be captured and presented. So the rest of the lecture, uh, which is mercifully brief, uh, goes through those three different types. Right, so business meta metadata. Um, we've got business glossary as a uh, as probably the key example of business metadata. So business glossary, a list of business terms along with a description. Who's seen a business glossary in the wild? Yeah. yeah? What form did it take? What technology did they use? Word or Excel? Anyone got any other examples? No? So business glossary, it's, it's like a dictionary. Um, it need not, uh, in, in fact it should not, be related to the, to the business intelligence system. It's defining all of the business terms across the enterprise, not just the terms that are defined in the data warehouse or in the business intelligence platform. So. Uh, We've got business glossary as an example of business metadata, which is a list of business terms. Who needs this information? Anyone? Anyone at all? Everyone. Business? It was a trick question, in fact. <laughs> Everyone needs it. It's not just business. We all need it. And it's one of the most powerful things in the, uh, in the organisation. So half the time, if you're, uh, if you're working at the, um, at the leading edge of an ETL, 
project or a business intelligence project and you've got, uh, got all these uh, requirements coming in or you've actually got users that, that have poorly formed requirements and you're the poor business analyst that's got to, uh, that's got to tease them out, right? they're going to be using terms that you don't understand that you have to look up. Right? And they should all be in a business glossary. So who's responsible for the business glossary? Is it us, the ETL team? Excuse me? Right, so the, the business glossary is wider than the, uh, it's wider than the data warehouse. We, um, excuse me? Different areas of the business would be looking after different aspects. Well, different areas of the business would, uh, would, would possibly own uh, different terms in the, in the glossary, but this needs to go up a little bit higher. I think the, the governance of a business glossary needs to be with the, uh, with the CIO or the CDO. Uh, it's not a responsibility of the, uh, of the data warehouse. So implementation options, uh, we've had um, Excel workbook, we've had uh, Word document. Are they, are they good implementations of a business glossary? A wiki, a wiki's a good one, yeah. Um, certainly uh, publishing your, um, your business glossary on the, uh, on the corporate intranet is, uh, is absolutely where this needs to be because uh, we just established that absolutely everyone needs the business glossary, uh, business and IT, uh, and it needs to be readily accessible. Um, IBM would, uh, would thank me to mention that um, they provide a tool that they conveniently call business glossary uh, <laughs> as part of their Infosphere suite. Um, and uh, another bank whose name I won't mention um, actually used it, uh, and they had it, uh, had it hotkeyed onto the um, onto the, uh, the standard desktop, and if you hit um, Control G, Alt G was it? Alt G, there you go. Uh, so Dave knows, <laughs> he must have worked at that uh, same other bank. Uh, if you hit Alt G, it goes to the G for glossary, and, uh, and you are then able to, to type in the term that you're looking for, and it'll search for it, uh, which is quite a convenient um, implementation, but look, if you don't want to pay for uh, the full Infosphere suite from uh, IBM, who would thank me for mentioning that, um, then uh, look, Wiki is, a, is another good thing, or look, if it comes down to it, just a, uh, just a web page on the, uh, on the internet. Look, if you have to scroll through a few terms in alphabetical order, then you know, it's, it's still a good solution if people can, um, uh, can bookmark it. Uh, but even better, if there was a... Uh, like all of our intranets have a uh, have a search box up on the up on the top right hand side that search for people or search in the the SharePoint directory for stuff. Uh, it would be wonderful if uh, if one of those option one of those search options was um, was business glossary as well. Um, a, uh, a telecommunications company that uh, that Murray knows very well. Um, they've got uh, what do they call it? Um, Jargon Buster. Is that right? Yeah, and uh, and that's on their their corporate intranet, which is uh, Jargon Buster is essentially a business glossary. Just type in your term, hit enter, and uh, it goes and searches for it. So uh, business glossary, wonderful thing, uh, business metadata, but not our responsibility. All right. So we the the BI team, uh, we may be involved, but we're not responsible for delivering on it. All right. Um, leading on from that is data dictionary now. People sometimes get confused between a business glossary and a data dictionary, uh, but they are very different things, um, even though data dictionary is still, uh, still defining terms. But it's defining, a data dictionary is defining terms within our BI solution. So in our BI solution, we might be presenting self-service reporting, for instance, and you can drag in your, your measures and dimensions and things like that, and you might look at a dimension and you go, well, I don't really know what that means. I'd like more information on that, and that's your data dictionary that's going to tell you what that is. Okay, so um, best place for a data dictionary is not going to be on the corporate intranet. Uh, if it's to do with the reporting that you can produce, the place that you want your data dictionary is actually embedded into the, uh, into the reporting tool. So you're in the reporting tool, you want to know what this term means, you don't want to go out somewhere else and search for it. So data dictionary has to be in there. So you might think, if I've got a business glossary do I, that defines all the terms, do I need a data dictionary? Yes, you do, because otherwise your, your users really aren't going to have access to it in the place that they need it. Um, so how's it different from a business glossary? If they both define terms, they're just 
two things that define terms that live in different places. Is there any way in which they're different? One is more conceptual and the other one is more based on logical. One's more conceptual and the other... Yeah, okay. So one is uh, one's certainly local to the um, to the BI solution. It will only define terms that are uh, that are in the uh, in the BI uh, BI solution. Which, uh, if it's a data mart, particularly that's only servicing one business area, could be quite local. Uh, whereas your business glossary really ought to be global across the enterprise. So business glossary is going to have a lot more governance problems in coming up with terms that everybody agrees on across the enterprise. Problems which we won't necessarily have in our, uh, in our BI environment, because often our BI environment is, uh, is just exposing um, non-enterprise-wide information. It's just subject area information within a, within a data mart. It's not always true. I get that it's not always true, but um, we, we don't often suffer those, uh, those, um, uh, those enterprise-wide uh, need to, uh, to to centrally define data in our uh, in our data dictionary. Um, the other key difference is uh, is the responsibility and accountability for the business glossary. Uh, sorry, for the data dictionary. They are absolutely our problem. Okay. Whereas the the business glossary uh, should go up to the it should be the um, uh, you know, chief data officer or chief information officer's problem, and uh, and they should be looking after that. We, as the data warehouse or the business intelligence platform, we absolutely need to be worried about the, um, uh, about the data dictionary and we need to deliver on it and we need to make sure that it is integrated with the, with the reporting tool. Sorry, if you, if you have a report that's on the corporate intranet that's got some terms on it, why would they not be in the business classroom? Um, they might be... Uh, so if we had a... Um, uh, so the, uh, the question for the... Uh, for the camera, <laughs> is um, if you had uh, if you had a report that uh, that you were presenting uh, on the corporate internet uh, intranet, uh, why would the terms in that report not be included in the business glossary? They may be local to a, to the particular business unit that is uh, that's consuming that report. So different business units might have different definitions of the same term. Uh, it, it it does exist in <laughs> in large organisations. It's one of the biggest problems for the uh, for the CDO is, uh, is coming up with, um, with common terms. The, uh, the client that I'm currently at now, which is another telecommunications company that's not the same one that Murray works at, uh, is, is currently spending an um, a, a awful lot of money uh, in, um, in funding the, the business glossary uh, and the, the project that sits above it to, to get a common definition of those terms because different, um, different business units describe things differently. Mm. Um, so, uh, so that would be the reason. Um, and uh, often, uh, we as the data warehouse uh, might want something included in the data dictionary. Uh, we might want something included in the business glossary, uh, for instance. But we may be unable to to get that implemented because we don't have the uh, we don't have the ownership of it. So we can really put what we want into the into the data dictionary that is integrated with the with the reporting tool. But we don't have that ownership of the uh, of the business glossary. We can't get everything that we want in there. Thanks, Steve. Murray, do we need disambiguation pages? Uh, well, yeah, if you if you can, well, you'll often you will find that in the business glossary that uh, it will um, it, a good business glossary will uh, will disambiguate a term um, in the same way that uh, that Wikipedia does it. So uh, you know it'll uh, define a term, then you know, brackets the. <laughs> The, the different ways that uh, that, that is known, or it yeah, might might be a disambiguation page, for instance. Yeah, that um, that's a possibility. But the um, look, the key difference is the uh, is the governance and ownership of it as uh, as business glossary. We can't control, and it define business glossary defines terms that uh, that often don't appear anywhere in the um, uh, in the BI platform. The data dictionary in the BI platform, we can control and we can put whatever we want in there or whatever is, uh, whatever is relevant, whatever describes the data that we expose to the business. 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'll, I'll Okay. All right. All right, uh, the other business uh, metadata is the logical mapping rules. So once again, we're in the, um, uh, we're in the ETL space. We're presenting up data to, uh, to the business, perhaps in the form of a, of a self-service reporting capability. Uh, we're showing them uh, that measures and dimensions, uh, and presenting information to them. Where does that information come from? Okay, uh, the, uh, that is, uh, that's something that, uh, that business are always wanting to know. Uh, <coughs> what are the what are the rules? So, so uh, what are the rules that um, that describe the uh, the source that that information came from, and the and the transformation rules that it went through in order to get onto that uh, onto that self service reporting capability? So, um, uh, so since we're capturing information at the same grain of the data as the data dictionary, uh, that is a um, at, the, at the data item grain. You might think that we can put that in with the data dictionary, but the timing is different because those logical data mapping rules exist long before the, uh, the data dictionary ever does. So data dictionary is something that happens at the end of a, end of a project when we're building the, the reporting layer, but those logical data mapping rules, we need them right up front. So they're not going to be mastered in the reporting tool. They're going to be mastered somewhere else. And they may be copied into the reporting tool because that's uh, that's a convenient place to expose them to the business. But it's not where they're going to. Uh, it's not where the master copy is going to live. Um, so uh, so when we come up with uh, uh, with an IT solution for data dictionary, a, a capability within our reporting tool to expose information to the business, that does not solve our logical mapping rules problem with. Uh, with metadata, we still need a place to capture that where the IT team can see those rules. So where the uh, the business analysts can capture the rules, or data modelers, data profilers can can capture the rules, and uh, and solution designers or ETL designers can read them and do uh, and create um, physical data mappings. All right, technical metadata. This is the fun stuff. All right, um, system inventory. Uh, so. We've, uh, we've just deployed a great big BI platform. We've got lots of ETL jobs. We've got lots of, uh, lots of reports and, um, and self-service modules. Um, system inventory is just a, a, a list of all of those physical uh, program components, uh, including version numbers and, uh, and change history. Why might we want that? Excuse me, sorry? Impact analysis, yeah, great. So, um, uh, can you give me an example of um, uh, of the type of impact analysis you might perform? Yeah. Okay. So, finding out how things all, uh, all all connect, and especially with those versions, to control that. Um, one of the things that uh, that I like to see is in a uh, in a production environment that you actually capture, um, or you're able to expose uh, version information like a build number uh, to uh, to the user, so that when defects are raised, you can capture the build number along with the uh, along with the defect, when it comes back to the support team to uh, to analyse the defect and, uh, and and try to trace it, they get that build number. From the build number, you can uh, reverse engineer all of the uh, all of the version numbers of the programs that are going to uh, make it up. And when you're going and looking at those programs, you uh, you're not necessarily looking at the current version. You're looking at the version that actually had the problem in production. All right, system inventory. Um, Database schema spec. So as a as a data modeler, this one is uh, is close to my heart. And when people say metadata, this is what I think of. This is the this is the data model diagrams and all of the love that goes into it. So uh, your entities, your uh, David's smiling at me there. <laughs> entities, uh, attributes, and relationships, um, and uh, the the diagrams themselves, of course. And if that's all you're doing, then you're not data modeling because you've got to capture the descriptive information behind them. Uh, so all the column descriptions, table descriptions, relationship descriptions, and all those things go into uh, go into making up the data model. Um, 
Problem is, uh, who uses Erwin around here? Anyone? Who's used Erwin? What, what else do we use as a data modeling tool? Anyone? Sorry? What? No? Um, like Sybase Power Builder or? Oracle SQL Denial, but that's actually not a bad one, yeah. Um, uh, good example, and uh, the uh, and Oracle will thank me for saying this, uh, but the uh, Oracle SQL Developer Data Modeler is um, absolutely free, as in beer. Uh, so you can develop your data models on there and, uh, and the entire team can see it by uh, downloading their own free as in beer copy of uh, Oracle SQL Developer Data Modeler, which is the problem with Erwin, uh, by the way. When you... Um, Irwin uh, desktop license is uh, something like a five-figure number, and that's not counting the decimal point. Um, your, uh, your valuable um, data model metadata can be locked away where very, very few people can see it. So you need a solution for getting that information out of your proprietary data modeling tool and presented somewhere where people can see it. Um, Fortunately, uh, CA will sell you a module that um, that extracts all that, that information and presents it on a uh, on a web page. Um, I'm trying to remember what it's called, but it won't come to me. It's Erwin something though. Um, Erwin, no, won't come to me. Uh, but such tools available. Uh, there might even be some um, business objects. It can read Erwin files. Oh, okay, yeah. So lots of organisations use uh, use Erwin, but it's always a problem in um, in sharing the uh, the data models. Uh, so uh, that other bank that I was talking about, um, they actually paid for the uh, the the web capability to extract all of the the data model information, and that was uh, that was pretty good. But that's the only site I've worked at that uh, has actually gone to those uh, those levels. Every other time I've, I've used Erwin, it's been the data modeler that has had access to it and all of the, uh, the design and development team, uh, and even the testers like data models too, and who doesn't like data models? Uh, they're, uh, they're all beholden to the, uh, to the data modeler. When they, um, when they want a diagram or they want an extract of all of the, um, the descriptive information that, uh, that, that underlies it, they've got to go to the data modeler and, uh, and get the latest information. Um, so, uh, so that's a big problem, um, and it's probably one of the key uh, elements of, um, of metadata. So um, think about it when you're choosing your, um, your data modeling tool, how you're going to expose that information to, uh, to the rest of the team. Um, ETL logic. Now, we talked, about, um, we talked about the logical mapping rules before in business metadata. So a business person might be interested in for a particular data item, where this data item came from, what what rules it passed through along the way, that's only of middling help to to a programmer though, okay? Because it doesn't describe how physically we are going to build this or physically the way we have implemented it. Um, so uh, look, depending on um, depending on the detail that you want to go into on um, on your ETL logic, you can capture. Uh, you can capture two levels of this information. So the intended physical data mapping. So if you've got all your physical table definitions within the data warehouse that you don't expose to the to the business, like often we have a layered data warehouse with staging and uh, and a, you know, a, a conformed or enterprise layer and a, uh, a presentation or a star schema layer. Is that familiar to to most people? That type of architecture. Yeah. So. Uh, and your data flows into one layer, into the next layer, and into the, the one after that, and you're going to have physical mappings between each one, physical mappings that make no sense at all to the business user. Uh, but they, uh, they do make, uh, make sense to programmers. It is uh, information that we want. A designer will want to express that physical data mapping before the code is built. And then after the code is built, we want a nice way to to visualise the, the way it was actually implemented as well. Uh, so there are sort of two problems there that, uh, that I haven't really distinguished on this slide, the intended physical data mapping and then the actual. Right? Um, so uh, how's it different to the physical code in the, uh, in the ETL tool? What well, you might think, uh, so for that second one, for the actual physical 
what was coded, you might think, well, the code's there. It's only the programmers that are going to want to use it. Um, and as someone who has worked in an organisation where I didn't have SQL Server integration services on my desktop, but I was interested in some of the rules that, uh, that had been coded into it, and going to a programmer's desk and asking them to find out how something works for me and finding out that there's a 15-minute turnaround on loading a package into, uh, into the desktop, that's not a metadata solution. Okay, if you want to know how, uh, how the physical code has been implemented and it takes you that long to, to load up a package and considering you may have to navigate to the end of that and go, well, actually, there's another package there somewhere that I've got to, got to go to, so I'll unload that package and, and load up another one. Um, that's, you haven't really got a, a, a metadata solution there. Um, with most uh, ETL tools, uh, most of the popular ones anyway, there is, uh, a, they usually come with a nice mechanism or a third party will develop a nice mechanism for extracting all of that code out of the ETL tool and presenting it in, a, uh, in an HTML format. Uh, what do we use here at ME Bank for, uh, for ETL? Um, SSIS. SSIS, yeah. Um, so the, uh, does, um, does Microsoft uh, provide a... Um, yeah, there's third party tools, yeah. Um, so Microsoft still doesn't provide anything natively? Yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> um, so who does? I know, um, uh, I know IBM do with data stage. Uh, you, can, you can generate um, not very good uh, extracts of the, um, uh, of the ETL jobs from, uh, from data stage, but at least they are integrated. So when you go from one to, to another. Um, don't know about any of the others. Anyone, you, Informatica? Yeah, it does. Oh, okay, right. So you can actually query, SQL query the, uh, the tables. Yeah, so it, it's one of those things that varies greatly from, um, from tool to tool. Uh, and um, and uh, David uh, Nguyen over there would, uh, would remind you that uh, if any of your ETL code is locked away in stored procedures, then no amount of um, uh, no amount of um, uh, physical data mapping extract tool presentation on a um, uh, on a uh, on an intranet is really going to help that uh, you're just going to have to delve into the code at that point. Um, so uh, so once again, yeah, think about when you're uh, when you're choosing your ETL tool, how are you going to get that information out again uh, to uh, to analyze, or you get, every time you want to. Um, you want to uh, trace something, you're going to have to bring up the code in the tool itself. All right, on to process metadata. Uh, this is actually the fun bit. I like this one. Um, all right, runtime job statistics. Uh, so, uh, list of scheduled running and completed ETL jobs, including duration, row counts, and job logs. Right, so uh, when, we, uh, when we run our ETL, we typ typically run things in batches, batches are a collection of jobs with dependencies between the jobs, yeah? And then a particular job itself, we use SSIS. When we open up an SSIS job, we've got lots of boxes there that show the flow of data through, through particular tools or transformations uh, in the job. So uh, we've got the batch level, job level, and transformation level. And most of our ETL tools will generate and store metadata on uh, the amount of data passing through each transformation or each job or each batch, the start time and end time, and perhaps some other metrics about that, uh, about that level, that, that node. Um, so what could we do with that if we captured it? Steve. Identify where a problem is if stuff's taking a long time to get delivered or delivering Brilliant. End, end times are being blown out. Yeah. Yep. Delaying getting source system filed, and you're waiting and polling for that stuff. Yep. So the end to end, uh, if the end to end uh, ETL time is, uh, is slow for a batch, we can find out the job that is taking most of the time. Uh, if a job is slow, we can find the transformation that's taking most of the time. If a particular job is taking longer than it used to, is slowly degrading, we can actually identify that. We can plot the, uh, the performance of that job over time. Uh, and if we capture you know, dates and days, for instance, we can see, see if the Monday instance of that job 
as uh, performance is degrading over time. All right, so pretty much all of our ETL tools will capture this, uh, the, these runtime job statistics in their own uh, proprietary metadata store. Sometimes it's, uh, it's not a proprietary metadata store, they'll capture it in, the, uh, in, a, uh, in a database itself, um, where you know, theoretically you could have access to, but why wouldn't we want that metadata, that performance metadata for our jobs, actually available along with the data that went through? So. If we're looking at a, uh, at a fact table, so this, I don't actually have a slide on this, but the, the, the data that we actually put into our, uh, into our data warehouse, we all capture the, uh, a date and timestamp, don't we? Uh, and we all capture a, a source system against a, against a row. So we actually capture metadata against all of the data in our data warehouse anyway. Right? Why wouldn't we capture, along, along with that, the job that processed it? How long that job took? When that job ran? What was the status of that job? Okay, that's all information that could be uh, could be valuable for for drill across. If there was any problem with the uh, with the data, you could analyse that that data, find a problem, drill across, find the job that that loaded it in. How long has this been a problem? We can go back and we can have a look at the uh, at all the job logs. Why isn't this particular row uh, got a problem? Oh, because that was uh, that was loaded by a different job, or it was loaded that job was rerun more recently. Um, so, if we think about all that data locked away, all that metadata, the process metadata locked away in our uh, proprietary data store for our ETL tool, we're actually missing out on, uh, on access to, uh, to a lot of valuable information. If we can bring that across actually into the data warehouse, uh, then we can analyse it. Um, now, uh, Kimball Group talks about uh, and has talked about for a long time, by the way, an audit dimension. Um, so uh, we can take, uh, so uh, they, they teach that, uh, that practice of taking our uh, facts and dimensions in our data warehouse and linking them to uh, an, an audit dimension that captures process metadata. Okay, and then we can, uh, no matter what we're looking at in the data warehouse, we can also capture, uh, we, we, we can drill across to the process metadata that generated um, Now, the audit dimension first appeared in, uh, in Kimball literature in 2002. So that source down the bottom, the Data Warehouse Toolkit. So one of the books that I passed around was Data Warehouse Toolkit version three. Uh, so that, uh, that one I found in second edition. So I may actually go back beyond that because I didn't, haven't uh, got access to a copy of first edition. Um, if you have a look at that audit dimension on the left, I don't know whether, you've, uh, whether you can see it from, uh, from where you're sitting. Um, we've got, uh, so I've got a fact in the middle, human resources snapshot fact. Uh, this is uh, taken straight out of the book, by the way, I didn't make this up. Um, extract completion time, uh, extract completion date, extract status, number of records extracted, um, transformation completed date and time, transformation status, number of records transformed. All of this information is information that's common to a job. Okay, so all of the rows that were loaded as part of the same job have the same information. Yeah, so if this is in a audit dimension, that audit dimension has a key, right, and we're presenting this as a star schema, then that, then that surrogate key of the audit dimension is gonna be against all of the same rows in the fact table that were loaded in that job. That's 2002. In 2004, uh, this is in the Data Warehouse ETL Toolkit. This is actually the, I think this is the book that, uh, that I've passed around. Uh, it doesn't have a version. I don't know whether they created a new version of that. Um, but uh, uh, Ralph Kimball revisited the audit dimension in that book and he's added three new things. Uh, extract timestamp, um, clean timestamp, oh, sorry. No, wait a minute, he's kept three things. So of all those things that we, that we saw before that were really job related or batch related, he's kept three of those, extract timestamp, uh, clean timestamp and conform timestamp. All the rest of it, we've got overall quality category, overall quality score, completeness category, completeness score. What he's done is he's refocused the audit dimension on data quality attributes. So I've had a look at the row coming in. I've gone, well, 
uh, you know, go through the uh, the individual data items. Is this uh, is this value out of bounds? Okay, is this a uh, is it an invalid value? Is it a um, may not we may not have fixed boundaries on it. Is it um, is it a value at the extreme end of a boundary? Like, is it within uh, is it outside four standard deviations of the mean? For instance, we might might be a suspicious value rather than an illegal value. Right? We might do all sorts of um, of quality analysis on the data that's coming in. Um, we might get a, uh, a, a null value and we don't want to load the, the null values uh, and we say, well, if it's null, then we take it to mean some default value, okay? But it really shouldn't be null in the, in the source system. So we've really, we've, at this point, we've overridden the, uh, the source system data. So all of these things that we do in transformation to measure the quality or manage the quality we might want to record the results of that. Okay, and we can record it in an audit dimension. But hang on, we didn't we just say the audit dimension contained all of those, those job uh, attributes? So if we've got one row per job execution, and we execute that job every day, and then we add quality attributes to it, not every row that we process in, the, in that particular job is going to have the same quality attributes. Not every row is going to be at the same level of quality. They're going to have different quality scores. They're going to have different uh, completeness scores. They're going to have different validation scores. I can see that dimension getting pretty big at that point. It's not one row per job anymore. It could be hundreds of rows per job. Okay? And that dimension is going to grow in an uncontrolled fashion. Um, the Data Warehouse ETL toolkit doesn't address that problem at all. But if we flash forward to uh, 2013, when, uh, when the third edition of the Data Warehouse toolkit was released, we have a look at the audit, audit dimension there, and it's a vastly reduced one. Um, these all appear just as examples in, his, uh, in uh, the, the case studies that, um, that appear in the book. There is no chapter on... Well, there is a chapter on audit dimension, but it doesn't say what you should capture <laughs> in there. Uh, so this particular example uh, had quality indicator, out of bounds indicator, amount adjusted flag, cost allocation version, and foreign currency version. Right, so those uh, those versions were um, uh, versions of an ETL rule that were applied in the transformation of this um, of this particular row. So all of these are. Um, uh, with the exception of the last two that are really constants for pretty much every row that gets loaded in, right, regardless of the job. Uh, all, of these, um, all of these values are quality-related values. So as of 2013, the audit dimension, according to the Kimball Group, is a quality-focused dimension, right? But what of all those teachings that said the, the batch and transformation and, uh, and job data, where they go now. <laughs> uh, and it, it's just a hole in the, um, uh, in the books. So I'm going to go out on a limb now, and I'm going go, uh, to go off book at this point. So uh, th this slide is not a Kimball teaching. This is, uh, this is what I reckon. This is what Ross reckons. Um, I say create separate dimensions for, uh, for audit and batch. Kind of makes sense. Yeah, because your batch dimension or your your job dimension, all the rows that get loaded in the same batch are going to have the same value for the surrogate key there. Right? So our dimension is not going to blow out. We're going to have one row in that dimension for every job that gets run. Sure, it's going to grow, okay, but it's not going to grow at an uncontrollable rate. Right? Quality dimension, or the audit dimension, is based on data quality attributes. Those data quality attributes, uh, you could get rows that are loaded on different days that have the same quality outcome. Okay, a, 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 a completeness score of 96, a validation score of, of 25. We're going to see patterns. Okay, we're going to see rows of the same quality uh, coming in, and we're going to reuse those dimensional values. So it makes sense that the audit dimension is not going to grow out of out of control either. All right. Uh, so process metadata um, with uh, <coughs> the Audit dimension attributes, so the ones that are uh, going through those three books, the ones that, uh, that I consider worthy of capture uh, would be a quality score, so 
um, actually putting a number against this so that we can uh, rate particular rows as higher quality or lower quality to, to other rows. Um, but then uh, th that's useful for comparing two rows. It's not so useful for presenting on a report got a quality score of 25. Um, it, it's, not, uh, it's not a valuable piece of information to the, uh, to the user. So throwing in a, um, uh, throwing in a category as well, so you know, high quality, low quality, that sort of thing. You make up your own categories that, uh, that make sense, the sort of information that you'd want to present, and, uh, and an indicator. for If you want to filter, filter out sort of low quality things, it's uh, yes, it's good enough to, to present, or no, it's not. Um, out of bounds, uh, so um, if you want to uh, identify, um, so th this is not a, uh, necessarily a quality indicator, but for, for numeric values, if you've got a, a value that is um, excessively beyond the, uh, beyond the mean value, it might just be suspicious, not, uh, not actually a measure of, uh, of quality, and those ones might be ones that you want to focus on. Uh, so having that information in your audit dimension could be useful, could save you some time in tracking them down. Um, and quality screening metrics. Uh, so if we're, uh, as we run the data through the, uh, through the ETL job, we're going to run a number of if-then statements to, uh, to, to validate our data. How many of those succeed? How many of those fail? Just a, a straight measure of, um, of success and failure on those. Uh, all right. Uh, in the batch dimension, um, we saw most of those in the, uh, in the earlier slide. Uh, we've got start and finish times for um, extract, transformation, load. Um, we've got uh, an overall status. So one particular row gets extracted, transformed, and loaded. Right? We want one status to, uh, uh, to, to tell us what the, the, the end result of that, of that process was. Obviously, it was somewhat successful because it got loaded into the data warehouse, didn't it? Uh, but it may have been loaded with um, uh, with some problems. Um, total record counts. Um, oh, sorry. Overall status. That's the overall status of the job, not for the row. Apologies. Um, uh, record counts uh, and ETL versions and uh, and build numbers. This goes back to the thing I was talking about before about uh, tracing the, um, the the build of a job. If we see a particular row, uh, that row was loaded by build number you know 37. We can trace that back to program version number, program names and version numbers, and uh, and see the actual code that loaded that job. All right, um, which leads us to error event fact. So we've got two dimensions now. We've got an audit dimension and a batch dimension or a job dimension, for for want of a better term. Um, but there's actually a fact that we're missing here. When we've run all of these validation rules, some of these validations have actually failed. Right? We've captured the number of validations that failed, or we've captured a score for the overall, for the overall row. Right? We might know that, that five of the validations failed. We don't know which five they were. Right? So the error event fact, this is not something that we can capture in the dimension, because what we actually have is we've got a granularity that is higher than the, the, the dimension that we're, that we're capturing. If we've got one... Um, uh, one row in the audit dimension could represent five different errors. It could re represent ten different errors. Okay, we need to capture those actual errors and the data that went into uh, went into making them. So we can capture that in an error event fact. So every single error on every single row generates a row in the error event fact. Okay, which is kind of hard to code in an ETL tool. Um, I've done it in. Uh, in data stage before, um, what I had to do was uh, you, you run all your screens, concatenate them into a single long string, and then uh, pivot them into uh, into one row per per error message. Pipe them into your into your error event fact. Um, can be done. It's just not it's not super easy. Um, I don't know how you do it in your chosen technology exercise. That's a um, uh, an exercise for home. Um, and of course, your error event fact, it needs dimensions. It's got, so you've got your, your batch dimension there and your audit dimension already ready-made. Okay, so you add those, add those onto that. And you're then in a position to analyse uh, all of the errors that have been generated by your, uh, by your ETL uh, using, of course, because it's all in your data warehouse, using your chosen uh, data warehouse analytics capability. 
And that brings us to the end. So uh, learnings are um, metadata. The metadata is um, you add it to data uh, to give you information, right? So uh, metadata is the context that, uh, that, that tells us what data means. Um, Kimball Group defines metadata in, uh, in three, different, um, three different categories, business, technical, and process. Um, simply capturing metadata, you've only done half of the job. If you've got it in a tool that nobody can read, then you're not adding context to your data. You're not producing extra information. So the, the key to a metadata strategy is uh, is working out how you're going to serve this metadata up to, to consumers, IT consumers and business consumers, in such a way that it's relevant. Okay? And the solution is not going to be the same for every different type of metadata. So we'll have our, like we said before, we'll have our business glossary in the, uh, in the intranet. We'll have our uh, data dictionary in our analytics tool, our reporting tool. We'll have uh, logical data mappings probably in an Excel spreadsheet, let's face it, uh, <laughs> somewhere in, uh, in project directories in, uh, in IT. We'll have uh, our extracts from, uh, from Irwin, our, our technical uh, metadata extracts from Irwin and from our ETL tool. Uh, hopefully we can put that on the intranet as well. Uh, but they'll be, in, uh, they'll be in different formats, in different, uh, in different tools usually. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the key is uh, capture the metadata and make it accessible um, in the place where it's going to be used. Um, and it must be, uh, the, the, the last teaching there is it must be understandable. Uh, you need to be able to make sense of it to, uh, in order to add that context to the data. And that brings us to the end. Uh, the exciting topic of metadata, I'm going to throw this open to, uh, to the audience. Who has questions? Yes. How difficult is it to map your business glossary to your data dictionary? Oh, um, look, uh, conceptually it should be very simple. Um, uh, the actual process of, uh, of well, controlling it, uh, controlling the mapping of the, um, of the business glossary to the data dictionary is difficult because of the two groups governing it. Uh, so, um, so I would say, uh, look, um, if I was in charge of the data dictionary for a BI platform, I would be going and knocking on the chief data officer's door and asking how I can partner with them to, uh, to leverage off their, uh, their business glossary and, and how we can work together because there is going to be a lot of overlap in there. I think the information needs to be presented in two places because not everybody who's interested in the business glossary is going to have access to the reporting suite, uh, and, and people that are in the reporting suite don't necessarily want to go all the way over to the business glossary to, uh, to define their terms. So yeah, definitely overlap. Can I, can I ask, I mean, uh, is there a tool that can do both? I don't know of one, so um, uh, once again, IBM would thank me for mentioning it. Um, the Infosphere uh, business glossary tool, I've never actually deployed that, I've used it. Um, uh, IBM, of course, uh, the, the Infosphere suite um, has a great many uh, things in it, including Data Stage, of course, the uh, the ETL tool. Um, uh, data dictionary-wise, what do they provide? Um, I don't know. Doubtless there is one. Uh, yeah, the rational. Yeah, probably the rational suite. Yep, uh, wouldn't surprise me. Um, I would. I don't know. I would guess that uh, that the big vendors like IBM would uh, would offer some level of integration there. Uh, I know Business Glossary is is somewhat new. I think it's like about ten years old. Um, and in deploying that, it wouldn't surprise me if they linked it into uh, to a product that they already own. How long have they owned Rational? Does anyone know? No. Um, sorry. The the short answer to a uh, to the long answer that I just gave. I I don't know of one that does, but it absolutely would not surprise me. Those uh, those big vendors would be targeting something like that. I would have thought. IBM's got the metadata workbench stuff in there as well. Right. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So um, metadata workbench. I haven't had the um, uh, the good fortune to work with it. Uh, I very 
No. Uh, probably got a data dictionary in there. Um, I think um, it's, that's where their data profiling tool is. The old profile stage is now in Metadata Workbench. I'd expect to see uh, a data dictionary in there. I also expect to see it linked to the business glossary. Yeah. Uh, a lot of tools have uh, multiple uh, sorts of BI tools in there and retrieve data from multiple data sources. So you can expose the primary key of that business glossary definition and be able to map it to a data dictionary. Assuming you have access to the underlying source of the, uh, of the business glossary. Yeah, well remember the business glossary might even be in a wiki. Uh, depends on what you, have, um, what you have access to. So uh, not everybody's going to be able to deploy a fancy tool like Infosphere. Um, I've, seen, I've seen data dictionaries that just have a link per line to a relevant business glossary items. Yeah, that's, um, that, that's probably a, uh, a good compromise. And I, I think it's, um, it, it's one of the things that I, was, uh, that I was getting at in the introduction to... Uh, to, to the lecture is you can't solve all of the problems, so concentrate on, on solving the ones that, uh, that add value. And, and certainly I think um, getting some consistency between your business glossary and your, uh, and your data dictionary, where it is possible to get, get consistency, is, is genuinely valuable. Uh, if we can't control the business glossary and we can control the data dictionary, then yeah, having a, having a hyperlink, especially if, it's, if the business glossary is in a wiki, Sticking a hyperlink on your on your data dictionary is a uh, is a pretty good low cost solution. I would have thought. Mary Armand. Yes. Uh, I'd like to. Uh, sorry, I, I sh really should have done this at the very beginning. Uh, I'd like to introduce our videographer. We've got uh, Mary Armand here. Um, Mary comes along to all these lectures uh, for the purpose of um, gaining YouTube hits. And, <laughs> and asking a question like this: uh, Back in your audit dimension. Um, in the second edition slide, one of the audit elements was max 70 score. Now, wouldn't max 70 score be 70? <laughs> right. That's, uh, let's just have a look at that one. There it is, just above the yellow. Just above the yellow. Max. The oh, very nice. So, <laughs> Murray, Murray's eyes are, uh, now did I, do you, I want to I see if that's, um, can someone turn to page 129 of the, uh, of the Data Warehouse ETL Toolkit and have a check of that because, uh, thank you, Murray, for putting that out. I want to know now whether I actually, uh, whether I screenshot that or whether I recreated it for the purpose of the slide because if I did, it's all on me. So I'm not going to put it on Ralph right now, but uh, I reckon it's his fault. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for that, Murray. Any other questions? Well, this audit dimension is a shared dimension across all the fact tables. Yes, uh, it's, it's actually, uh, it's not just a shared dimension across all the fact tables, it's a shared snowflake dimension of all the dimension tables as well. Yeah, so every, um, every piece of data that we push through the ETL is going to have quality attached to it. Uh, and so we can snowflake this off, the, um, uh, off all our dimension tables as well. What's wrong with it should have quality attached rather than yeah. well, it is possible to, to score every piece of data that we load via the ETL uh, on, on quality metrics, uh, assuming we do run some quality screens over them and we don't just blindly load them into the, into the warehouse. We don't, no one does that, do they? Just <laughs> load data without validate, no, I wouldn't have thought so. Anyone else? I really want to thank everyone for, uh, for coming in and listening to um, what I said was uh, was a very dry topic. Uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your uh, your Wednesday night. Uh, the slide pack I will send out with a uh, with an invitation to give feedback on the uh, on the presentation, and the video will be up on uh, on YouTube and going almost viral in a couple of weeks, <laughs> couple of weeks maybe a month. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming in. See you later. Have a good night.